is uh, uh, legal services to nonprofits and public charities. And so a little bit about me, my name is Rocky Kavagnot and I'm a, I would quite say a new attorney at Hull and Chandler, just started in uh, October of last year. But uh, prior to uh, coming on board at Hull and Chandler, I uh, taught at the law school that was once in Charlotte where I ran the nonprofit legal assistance clinic and community development clinic. And then for two years in between that uh, period, uh, before returning to price law, I actually ran a community action agency in my hometown of Salisbury. And so uh, with my practice now in the nonprofit and public charity sector, I bring both the practice aspect and also being in the trenches. And so when I met Don Jonas the first time, I had, we were able to uh, share a couple of war stories about being executive directors uh, in, a, uh, you know, in, a, in a public charity, a nonprofit public charity. And so one of the things that we're doing with um, leadership series is trying to highlight uh, topics of concern or, or just interest, uh, particularly, you know, obviously we've had a pandemic going on, that's a huge issue, but life, there are other issues, you know, uh, involved in the nonprofit sector and others, uh, pandemic or not. And so today's topic uh, is uh, Medicaid transformation and uh, what you and your nonprofit need to know. And so while technically, I guess the transformation is on hold, I guess a lot of it because of the pandemic, it won't be on hold forever. And so today's topic, today's discussion is gonna, particularly if you are a public charity in the social service sector, particularly in areas of say housing, transportation, food insecurity, or dealing with intimate partner violence in those sort of areas, then you definitely wanna to listen to today's uh, discussion. And so um, I have the great privilege of uh, introducing our, uh, our, our guest today is, um, Don Jonas, who's the executive director of CARI. Uh, but I know as an executive director, he knows his elevator speech better than I do. And so I will let Don tell you a little bit about himself and, and CARING and its mission serving the population here in Charlotte and Carolina. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Rocky and uh, Shannon. And those of you who are able to join us today, I'm uh, Don Jonas. And I am, as Rocky mentioned, I'm executive director at CARING. Uh, CARING has been in the Charlotte market uh, since the 1950s. We have always had a mission to help individuals with limited resources establish and maintain good health. Uh, we've done it in lots of different ways through the years. We currently have a clinic that's a low cost clinic that's in Uptown Charlotte. It's really designed to help people that don't have public or private insurance but need access to affordable, excellent care. And we do a variety of different uh, chronic disease management programs for people there. We can see upwards of 2,500 people a year uh, we also, uh, on behalf of the Mecklenburg County Medical Society, we oversee the Physicians Reach Out program, uh, which is really the only access point for specialty care in Mecklenburg County for people without public or private insurance. Um, just last year, our fiscal year ended in June, uh, we had the most uh, donated care in the history of the program. We've been running it uh, in Mecklenburg County for 14, 15 years now. And uh, it was almost $52 million in donated care from Ortho Carolina and Novant and Atrium and our hospital partners. Almost 1,600 different physicians volunteer with us uh, to care for the poor at no charge. Um, serves about, last year, a little over 6,000 people we were able to connect to care uh, from volunteers in our community. We also run a nurse family partnership program, which is a home visiting program for low income moms that are pregnant for the first time. Uh, this is a national program. It's in hundreds of cities and areas around the country, every state of the country. Um, the idea is to have a, a registered nurse that gets attached to a mom who's pregnant for the first time. Uh, and if we're able to identify that mom up to 28 weeks of gestation, we have a nurse on our team that will go with that mom through the birth of the child and until the little one is two years old. They'll make over 65 visits to the home before COVID, but now uh, continued virtual visits um, during this whole process. And the, the results are pretty extraordinary for the health of the mom and the health of the baby and the long-term economic self-sufficiency for the family. And um, we've been here again doing this for 60 years. Uh, COVID has changed our world in a thousand different ways. We may talk about some of that a little bit, Rocky. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is maybe um, a, a key uh, point here is that we've, in addition to doing those programs, in addition to being a resource for people with limited resources, we're also uh, thinking strategically about how do you build a better system of care? How do you prepare for larger changes that are impacting not just us, but and not just everyone that's in 
uh, the healthcare space serving low income people, but anybody that's in a nonprofit that's uh, providing essential services to families uh, are gonna be impacted by some of the changes that are on the, on the very near horizon for the way Medicaid operates in North Carolina. Absolutely, so I think that uh, most of the folks I think who have chimed in, you know, they're definitely interested in, you know, what the, does my, me and my, or my, my nonprofit and I need to know about Medicaid transformation. But before we get into that, maybe we you can pull back the lens a little bit and let's just kind of discuss what in the world is Medicaid to kind of start off with, just to kind of give folks an idea, because maybe you're coming into this cold, maybe someone said, oh, Shannon said to get on this, this, uh, on this uh, webinar. And um, so, so Don, just, just for the lay person, what, what's Medicaid? Yeah, so this is my, my conversation with my mom and my mom's friends who have no idea what I do for a living. They ask me that sort of question quite often. Um, so Medicaid uh, is a federal state uh, public program that provides access to care for low-income people uh, across the country. Um, different states have different eligibility requirements for who can get access to care. Um, in North Carolina, it's, you know, it's targeted towards very low-income people, towards uh, pregnant moms that are very low income towards the disabled. Uh, we have not been as expansive in um, who could receive Medicaid services in North Carolina than many other states around the country. For those of you that have followed the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. and uh, the, op the option that states have to expand Medicaid to their uh, working age population that doesn't receive insurance through their employer, North Carolina is now, I think it's either the 10th or the 11th state in the country that is elected not to expand uh, Medicaid. Um, and that has meant that in North Carolina, depending on which demographer you go to, there's five or 600,000 people that could be eligible for Medicaid in North Carolina that are not. Uh, you still are looking at um, today, one and a half million people in North Carolina that are on Medicaid. And if you're in the Mecklenburg County area, upwards of a couple hundred thousand people, almost one in five of us uh, are on Medicaid or have a loved one on Medicaid or have someone that you know, in your zone of influence that is on Medicaid. So it's a hugely pop, uh, important program to understand because it's really the backbone for providing a raft of services, really essential healthcare services to lower income people across the country. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, so that's a little bit about Medicaid. So obviously the discussion is transformation of Medicaid. So for many of those who are coming here, say, so, okay, I know what Medicaid is. It's a, I got, obviously it's federal money goes to the different states and states determine the eligibility for, uh, for, for Medicaid services. And you know, obviously our state to this date has chosen not to expand into the ACA's you know, sort of uh, umbrella of allow, allowing more people to be covered under um, uh, Medicaid, not making it a, you know, not trying to make a statement about that. that's just a fact yeah. that, you know, the, right. that we have chosen uh, to date have not uh, allowed, have not expanded access to Medicaid. But, um, but now we're talking about transforming Medicaid. And I know many of you are um, in the, in particularly with the public, uh, public charities or social service agencies maybe saying, all right, but I, you know, I'm not like caring. I know caring is a public charity, um, but you guys don't do Medicaid or at least not yet. Is that? No. You know, we don't process any public or private insurance. We're, we're mm -hmm. it's, and many of our services during COVID have been free. We sometimes mm -hmm. have a smaller charge to access the care or to be eligible for a year to receive services. But most of our services are very uh, cost, uh, very low in cost or free. But mm -hmm. no, we don't process Medicaid now. Yeah, I mean this is, and so I think one of the takeaways that you'll that you'll get is that I think that you've told me just saying that you know obviously. Um, with uh, and we'll talk a little bit of more, more about social determinants of health, but I think you know obviously it's an easier kind of under it's easier to kind of grasp the idea that well caring runs itself this way. It's his business model. Um, at you, it's it would imagine that there's a clear track for caring to become involved in the Medicaid transformation um, down the line. But as we're going to forward, there are going to be a lot of pathways for non you know. Uh, Typ I mean, not typical, no one's typical in the social service public uh, charity area. But again, as I mentioned, if you're involved with transporting low income people, you're involved with feeding low income, housing low income people, if you're involved with protecting uh, uh, particularly uh, the victims of in a, in a partner violence or something like that, mm -hmm. keep your ears open. Because um, I think that one of the takeaways is that you may very well be on as much a path, possibly again, 
as, as an organization of caring to look at uh, Medicaid transformation. So we understand that Medicaid is there, but now our state uh, is, is wanting to transform Medicaid. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about what does this uh, transformation of Medicaid entail? Yeah, sure thing. So um, North Carolina is really the last of the large states that hasn't already shifted its Medicaid program away from a fee-for-service program to uh, a value-based care system. So, you know, what I mean by that, again, I'm talking to my mom and her friends that have no idea about anything that I do. Um, and I apologize if I'm dumbing it down too much for some of the policy um, wonks on this uh, call. But in a sense, essentially in a fee-for-service system, which has been so much of America's healthcare system for a long mm -hmm. time, you were, you know, providers were paid for each service that they provided. So each time there was a, an operation on a knee, everybody that got in that did something with the knee had a fee. Then they collected that fee and the outcomes for the patient didn't necessarily matter. Uh, it was hopeful that everything went well and the patient got better. Uh, but the way our healthcare system was structured uh, and this is, you know, both the private market and in Medicaid for years and years, uh, was it was not designed that way. It was designed to collect fees to provide services. And what a number of states have figured out and have tested over many years is, could you switch that model around where you're not just paying for fees, but you're paying for healthy outcomes. You're paying for um, long-term prevention of disease. You're paying for um, populations of people being healthy and not just through the specific fees that are charged to switch to this whole value-based notion that there are um, ways to think about people beyond that you know, limited targeted clinical intervention and you look at what do people that are in with limited resources really need what are the variety of different services that may be necessary and I think you also you think about some people may have a economics or a financial background on it that if you, if you just look at the future numbers for the costs of Medicaid in a state like North Carolina, it just continues to go up. There's no end to the demand of consumers in order to receive uh, payment in order for people to, that are on Medicaid. And so there's also a look at, you know, can we, could we shift the way that Medicaid operates so that we can have a better sense of our future budgets and that we can make longer term plans about how we're going to invest money in North Carolina for healthcare, but education and lots of other things. So it's kind of, North Carolina has been sort of late to the party, but that has been the good news is it's given mm -hmm. us a chance to think through what kind of model would really work best in North Carolina and what, what lessons can we learn from other states about uh, how their experience of shifting from fee for service to a value-based system occurred and, and what, what can we put in place to try to maximize the likelihood that we'll have a much better uh, result here in North Carolina. Okay, so you said something about a value base. So I know that we obviously just discussed fee for service. We all know that, you know, like uh, you get the, before you hit that deductible, you see those bills from, you know, all those and like, okay, I gotta, I gotta pay out till I hit, you know, yeah. uh, a certain amount. So everybody, I think all of us are very familiar with the fee for service. This outcome base though is a little bit different, right? So this is, um, and so you talked about value. Could you, um, could you elaborate a little bit about um, when you talk about um, if obviously there's fee for service, but then what is, what is a, a value or outcome-based um, healthcare um, dynamic look like? Yeah, I mean, so in, in essence, what's occurring is that the insurance companies and the providers are going to be at risk. So they're going to be willing in this new system um, to take on the risk of seeing to it that uh, the patients that are under their care at a capitated amount, you know, a set fee per month for that population of people that they're serving, uh, that they can keep them healthy, they can make them well. Um, and the, the onus is on the provider and the payer to see to it that at the end of the day, at the end of the month, the end of the year, uh, that that individual um, ends up healthy. And there's, all, there's a variety of different quality metrics that the North Carolina Department of Health Human Services has negotiated with the insurance companies that will be a part of this. The upside is that uh, if an insurance company and a provider, they're working together, if they can provide that care at less than what they're, being, they're receiving in that capitated fee, that's uh, revenue, that's earnings, that's something that they can reinvest in their practice, that's something they could reinvest into a variety of different prevention measures to get even better results with their population. Uh, the flip side of that is if they're not capable of keeping somebody healthy, at above that at that capitated fee, any a dollar above that fee, you, you're at risk as the provider uh, to come up with that money to provide the additional care that's necessary. So it 
it changes the whole way that people uh, operate and the way they function within the system. And I think what's particularly interesting and important for us as Caring, an agency that you know, all of our work is around helping people with limited resources, is we, we want to make sure that we want to do everything we can to improve the likelihood that low-income folks that have never walked into a system like this, they have, there's been some care management that's occurred in some of the Medicaid um, funded uh, pilots and other projects that are around the state, but by and large, folks are not used to having a third party that they have to go through in order to access care. They're not used to looking at a variety of different insurance companies and choosing which one might work best for their family. Um, they don't, I don't, very few people would be unexpected to have a lot of health insurance literacy in this world. And people that are very low income don't have the experience of working with an insurance company in order to identify where they could go. And so we're, we're, we are particularly interested in Mecklenburg County and some of the things that we're learning here, we're sharing with folks around the state to see to it that we educate people as best as we can so that they are ready for when this shift occurs. So I think like, and I think I mentioned it earlier, and I think this kind of plays into the Medicaid transformation and I'll ask for uh, a definition, but it's a buzzword that goes around in the, in the nonprofit sector. You hear it a lot. Um, I know when I was running the community action agency, um, because uh, one of our major funders is the Office of Economic Opportunities under DHHS in Raleigh. And so when I took over as executive director, I started getting all these, you know, formulated memos from Mandy Cohen, who was the new you know, director of, of health and human services. And they started talking about, well, obviously opioids. That was one that I, I got a lot of information about opioids, but I also got a lot of information about something called social determinants of health. And I think that's the linchpin about, uh, you know, because many of you who are involved, again, in if you're housing the poor, if you are feeding the poor, if you are getting transferred, if you're Meals on Wheels and you're transporting food to the poor, right? Um, uh, you know, you want to be interested because uh, this notion of social determinants of health, I think that I, I've looked at the, some of the data. I think that our state, and this is what makes us, I think, kind of unique because we are a little bit late to the party. Um, most of the states have called, asked for what, and this is the wonky term, a, a 1115 waiver of Medicaid. It's a, a because typically yeah. Medicaid only pays for drugs. It only pays for doctors. It only pays for things that you would think are, well, medically necessary. And um, when we get into this topic of the social determinants of health, Medicaid historically has disallowed costs or just said, we're not going to pay for anything, even though it might work, we're not going to pay for um, something called a social determinant of health. And so uh, what we're seeing right now is the opportunity uh, down the road to see more things called social determinants of health get paid directly by the Medicaid program. And that, that, mm -hmm. that's a revolutionary concept. Um, and so, Don, why don't you like, let's talk about uh, social determinants of health. This is exciting stuff. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, that's this, the social drivers, some people call it, you know, that are pushing people towards good health or poor health. Uh, there's just such a recognition now that you know, the vast majority of what makes anyone healthy is far beyond any kind of intervention that occurs within the clinic's walls. It's really important that you have access to care. It's a, really a, a core offering that we provide. But what the literature is telling us is very clear that the what happens in your neighborhoods and what happens in your uh, outside of work and what happens with your social network, uh, what happens with your health behaviors has in some cases upwards of 80% determines your health and your long-term uh, vitality. And that, that's really been, you know, we've seen it you know, as an example here at Caring. We, you know, when people come to see us, they, they have a variety of different, usually primary care needs when they're coming to our clinic. Uh, but we ask people, what are their, what are their biggest uh, issues in their life right now? What are their biggest challenges they have? And for the last couple of years, the number one answer has always come back that it's food. It's access to food. And it's access to, in some cases, what's occurred with now that COVID is here, is access to emergency allocation of three days worth of food. And so what would normally happen at Caring, it used to happen, I have to admit, maybe just even a year ago, where someone would say that to us and we would say, you know what, we have a partnership with Loaves and Fishes. And let me tell you where Loaves and Fishes is and where you can go to get your food. And these are people that are very low income. There's a health concern that's happened to them. That's highly likely there's unstable housing. Um, and now we found out that there's a food issue and we directed them somewhere else to go get their health. And we recognized that we weren't being a good partner. We had to think 
broader about the social determinants and not just the clinical intervention that we're really good at doing. And so we uh, worked with Loaves and Fishes and created an emergency food shelter at Caring that's about 30 steps down the hall from our clinic so that when we find that that's a case, we can immediately provide people the, the short-term humanitarian assistance that they need with food, but to also get them connected into Loaves and Fishes so that they can um, have a longer-term solution to their food needs. And we've started to do that in lots of different ways. We have a memorandum of understanding with Crisis Assistance Ministry so that uh, the families that are in our Nurse Family Partnership Program, if we identify that uh, they're in substandard housing or they're in, at imminent threat of the lights going off or uh, they don't have adequate furniture where they're living, we can get to the front of the line at the furniture bank at Crisis Assistance Ministry. We can see to it that the lights don't go off because what we're starting to recognize in the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. is that while I'm a healthcare agency, I could be the world's greatest provider of healthcare for the people, the 7,000 plus people that we serve every year. But if people are going home to substandard housing or they don't have access to food or they don't have access to reliable transportation to get to work or they're socially isolated or they haven't had education on the range of different things that they need to survive in this world, it's all for naught. It's, we have to be working together. We have to be recognizing that the needs that people have are not in little bits and pieces. They're all, we take people at their whole. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really exciting when you alluded to it before, Rocky, about in this Medicaid transformation that's coming, there's also uh, these pilots, uh, if you're not mm -hmm. familiar with them, called the Healthy Opportunities Pilots. We received one of these Section 115 waivers that allowed us to do our transformation. And part of that the federal government allocated $650 million to go to anywhere from two to four pilot uh, regional efforts across the state of North Carolina. Mecklenburg County is one of, I think, seven or eight, maybe mm -hmm. nine different mm -hmm. regions that have applied for this funding. And as you intimated, Rocky, this is funding so that it's not just going to provide additional dollars for uh, clinical interventions. It's actually thinking much more broadly around how can we create uh, programs and then we can analyze those programs to see that is it more cost effective for the state of North Carolina and the taxpayers of North Carolina to use Medicaid dollars to keep somebody in a in a house so that they have um, a refrigerator that works to keep their insulin working or is it better to just allow that person to not be able to be in the house their insulin doesn't work and then they come racing back into the system to get care this is an example keep the lights on in a house provide uh, rental assistance provide transportation provide a range of workforce services so that people can get into the workforce. Use Medicaid dollars for that. And these waivers are going to allow North Carolina to test the utilization of Medicaid in ways that have never been tried before. I mean, the eyes of the country are looking at North Carolina for how this is going to be done. And we have a proposal that's together, from, again, from Mecklenburg County and seven or eight other groups around the state. I don't know who's going to be the winner of that. Um, those those uh, two to four groups are each of them will have somewhere in the order of 150, could have 150 to $200 million to spend over the next five years testing out entirely new ways of addressing these social determinants of health and seeing if there are better ways to invest in the lives of people that are very low income with Medicaid dollars uh, to help them and their families thrive. It's incredibly exciting yeah. uh, what's, what's right, what we're right on the precipice of in North Carolina. I'm hopeful that uh, Mecklenburg County and this region, the proposal we put forward gets funded because that would be really quite extraordinary to be right in the middle of one of those pilot sites. Absolutely. I mean, so yeah, so right now, I mean, it's on, a little bit on hold, but there is at least there, the Medicaid waiver is allowed $650 million to be paid over the next five years um, to uh, address health issues, but through um, potentially through funding things such as social determinants of health. So you know, again, you know, uh, an example, another example, you know, if you've got a, a, a low income uh, individual child person suffering from asthma, right? And so if the funders are saying, we want results. So instead of just, okay, we're going to keep prescribing you albuterol until the, until the cows come home, then what if uh, they did you a care ring looks and they said, okay, we did a diagnostic of this house. It's an unhealthy house, the living right. for the child. Uh, there's like, uh, maybe there's, I wouldn't say lead, but maybe there's a, a, a the carpet is just so dirty and it's right and just needs to be changed out and maybe laminate or wood or something needs to be put down. And right. so 
you get together with maybe one of those um, nonprofit do rehabilitation or weatherization or something like that. And there's the opportunity for that particular social service nonprofit, which, you know, has probably historically just gotten some grants or, or, or you know, or maybe yeah. get some fundraising, but now to actually get a check, not now, you know, it'll come from the different uh, carrier. And I think, and, and um, one of the things that, but the idea that, that, that service that you do, if it could very well get you um, another check. I don't want to sound crass about it, yeah. but that's that's sort of that's sort of it. And so, the kind of so if you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm a nonprofit. Uh, I'm in the Charlotte area. Um, I would say uh, based on I did look at who are the uh, folks that are applying to be what they call lead LPEs. Or, I guess um, these are the counties that if you are in and around these counties. Um, there's a possibility that this healthy opportunities could be coming your way. So Mecklenburg, obviously, uh, the lead applicant there is, I believe, the uh, is the health of, is the public health Mecklenburg department, County. right? That's right. And so um, if uh, if it comes to Mecklenburg, I think probably if I am a nonprofit director, I'm going to talk to the public health department. I'm going to try to find out what are their plans for uh, assuming they get hold of that that bucket of uh, uh, of resources. You know. Um, yes. But if you are in um, Buncombe, there's an applicant out of Buncombe. If you are in Forsyth, uh, Durham, Wake, Cumberland, Pitt, and, and New Hanover. So basically kind of the larger areas, although some, a lot, uh, it skews a little bit east, but then a lot of our poverty kind of skews a little bit east as well. So, um, so those are kind of the counties where this, uh, this, uh, uh, this pilot could come in. So um, you can find out who the applicants are. Obviously, you know, one is obviously in Mecklenburg County. Um, but there are a, a number of other applicants, and again, I think they said two to four of, of these are, I think what I see here are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So two to nine. four of that nine. I feel pretty good about, uh, I, I feel pretty good about Mecklenburg just because they can't ignore Mecklenburg. They just, they can't well, ignore us, right? <laughs> and the, we have the largest, you know, percentage-wise, the mm -hmm. largest number of folks on Medicaid. So there, yeah. there is a case to be made to, for some of that to come here. Absolutely. And, um, you know, so, and, and then the other players that if I'm a nonprofit, right, I want to get to know a little bit better are sort of the new players in town. Because remember, Medicaid, the way it was, the fee for service, there, I guess it was running through DHHS or whatever, just a, like a, like one payer, right? I guess, I know there's discussions in healthcare reform about there's a single payer and a multiple payer. Well, we kind of in the Medicaid are kind of a single payer, but then it's now it's going to be multiple payers. And so um, the, there was actually like a whole, um, there was a whole race, basically, the lack of it when I was in, yep. I was monitoring this, like who's going to win this race to get into the uh, get into the good graces of the state Medicaid program. And so, if I'm a nonprofit, I'd also want to make some connections with these following uh, groups: Amera Health Caritas, um, <laughs> United Healthcare, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, WellCare, and um, there's one local group called Carolina Complete Health Network. And uh, they will be in what they call regions three and five. So they're only going to be in two regions. But those are some of the other players that you may want to, because, you know, as you're running your nonprofit, you know, you, you got to hustle. You got to start, you know, because if you want to, you know, they're not going to come looking for you. You need to go looking right. for them, right? Because this is, yep. um, and so those would be some, uh, you know, some players. I, I, one of those particular health groups, when I was in community action, I met them at the community action uh, conference in Wilmington uh, last year. And I was able to, uh, uh, they wanted to use the auditorium where I was running uh, to, to because th on their end, they're trying to sign people up because now Medicaid, everyone's dispersed, right? Everyone's a free agent in a sense, right? And, uh, and these groups need to go and make their pitch to why their managed care outcome is the best. And, and obviously there's, there's room for educators about these plans, kind of like the navigator for the Obamacare. I mean, there's, you know, for these folks, there's going to be a need to understand which is the best? Because if they don't act, then the state, I think, is just going to randomly sign them up to one of these uh, these carriers. So basically, the money is going to go to these guys, and these are the ones who are sweating it. So those five groups that I told you about: AmeriHealth, Caritas, United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, WellCare, and Carolina Complete Health Network. These are the folks who need the outcomes, and so they will be coordinating with either the health department in Mecklenburg or some of these other players, and they they will start to kind of fine tune. Who are the type of groups that are going to get um, get this healthy opportunities money? But again, um, as we talked about, social determinants of health. I mean, it is it is precisely those areas. Of, again, um, if you are a, a a nonprofit, particularly in the areas of uh, housing, 
uh, food insecurity, transportation, um, stress, intimate, intimate partner violence. Am I missing another? I think it's a, yeah, that's right. In those areas. So if you're a domestic violence shelter, I mean, that's, that's a perfect uh, applicant for, because if you think about it, if somebody has, uh, you know, has certain chronic things and, and, and you're getting paid to kind of shelter them from the stress that's causing them all of, you know, mm -hmm. these maladies, then it's, it's something that you've already doing. But now is an opportunity to kind of think about maybe there's another payer or another, I, I know it sounds a little crass, but trust me, I mean, you ran, you run nonprofit. I used to run when you're always thinking, how do we keep this place afloat and how do we meet our mission? Because that's ultimately the key. And now this is the first time where I think the feds and the way we fund healthcare is meeting our missions. A lot of times you're trying to match your mission to try to meet this. Now right. it's coming to you. And so I think that is an exciting um, opportunity. And again, it's, it's a little bit on hold, but you know, I think that um, there, but I will say this, and I think this is a fantastic uh, thing that caring has, 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 Put some skin in the game. Caring is is uh, really um, trying, and I don't know. Is this too soon to kind of talk about? Uh, no, let's caring. do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I will hit the share button. I know. So now mm -hmm. we're going to get visual here, and um, maybe uh, Don, you can talk a little bit about this wonderful, wonderful website um, uh, that that Caring has helped put together has put together. As you can see, brought to you by Caring. Yeah, I appreciate it. We um, this was part of a. As, as we finished off our strategic planning work about a year and a half, gosh, almost two years now, uh, our board said, you know, it's, let's keep doing the access programs that we have in place. In fact, let's grow them. Let's serve more folks through a home visiting program and the connection to care for people without insurance. And let's keep our clinic running and the chronic disease work we do there. But let's, let's also step back for a moment and think about what have we learned about how we care for people and how do we work collaboratively with our hospital partners and with other clinics? And how do we step back and think, what are those big changes that are coming down the pike that's going to impact all of us? And that it's going to impact the, you know, the 7,000 people we serve, it's going to hit everybody. And there was a grant opportunity from the KP Reynolds Charitable Trust uh, to talk about this Medicaid transformation, this shift that's occurring to um, from fee-for-service to value-based care and moving towards a system that incorporates behavioral health, with physical health, and it has this healthy opportunities piece. It has this thing called NC Care 360, which is this whole new system that will uh, be an online system that will be like a closed loop, loop referral network that all the folks that Rocky mentioned about before are going to need to be a part of it. It's and we can go into it further. Yeah, no, I, I think that NC 360, and um, there is also uh, something called Aunt Bertha. And the reason I, I remember that is that when I was running the action agency. I had Novon and Atrium approach me because at the Community Act, we ran Head Start. So we did Head Start in five counties, served uh, 1,081 children and families. See, I remember my, <laughs> my elevator mm -hmm. speech to myself. Um, and they wanted you to get caught up in the referral network, right? Because even those players at Novon, Atrium, why are, they, why are they sending their emissaries to talk to the guy running the Head Start program? Because they understand that they need to, they want to get, they, everyone operates in silos. And I think any of you who are in the nonprofit sector kind of know that a little bit that, you know, unless like, you know, you go to one of those executive director hobnobbing sort of things or something, you, you really are kind of, because you're so focused on your own mission, you don't see how your mission aligns with other folks. And it's sometimes mm -hmm. hard because there's a lot of pressures on organizations to sustain themselves, to meet their mission. I mean, you know, it, it I, I will say this, Donnie, again, you know, Anyone who's an executive director, I mean, trust me, you have one, I'm going to, I went back in the law because that was hard. <laughs> it was a thankless, difficult, um, but it was, it was, it, it was definitely um, a fantastic experience. But I, I would say that, uh, you know, you're thinking of different things. And I think this is an opportunity where um, you start to look at your clients, you look at your stakeholders in a more holistic fashion. Um, and so, yeah, so if you are um, a social service agent, you, maybe you have been approached already by maybe one of the bigs like Atrium or Novant, or maybe by uh, the, the Medicaid program itself with the NC360. I'm pretty sure that one of the qualifications for getting in on this is you're going to have to join NC360. So in addition to mm -hmm. knowing some of those, those healthcare players and knowing who maybe the lead agency will be, assuming, you know, depending after the shakeout is... Um, is to go ahead and get your agency 
uh, signed up into NC360. Um, and I mean, you know, if, if Atrium or Novant has already kind of approached you about getting your, your organization onto the Aunt Bertha network, you know, I mean, you might as well just get that done. But I think that uh, I would imagine that probably a prerequisite for your agency getting uh, any kind of direct funding is that you've got to be on the 360. I mean, I, That's right. I would, I would be, I, I, it, how they would not make that a requirement would get me beyond me. So um, if yeah. you're not sure, go ahead and Google NC uh, Care 360 and see by getting your agency already kind of uh, onto it to see it because it will serve as a referral point. Because I think one of the things that they're trying to do is want to break all the silos among all of us in the nonprofit sector. And That's that, right. That uh, so if somebody goes to Caring, Caring can access NC360 and know who does Head Start in what county, who does um, you know behavioral health for you know in this one county, who's where's the domestic violence shelter in in some county, right? Um, you know it's it's always you know it it is you know it's 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 going to make it's going to result in better outcomes because people will it, you know you'll be able to go to the source of what is the mm -hmm. ailments here um, and, and, and such. And so this, this site is a fantastic site. I'm gonna leave it to yeah. John to tell you about So, it. I mean, that, that was one of the things that, you know, we wanted to try to do as we dove into this. We had funding for a year from KP Reynolds to try to disentangle some of the confusion and, and the um, what is a very complex shift that's occurring as we move away from fee-for-service. And so we worked with a number of different partners. Um, Health Leads is a group that's based out of Boston that does a lot of social determinants work around the country. And uh, Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy here, we, we partnered with them. They're an outstanding resource on, on justice for healthcare matters and many other things for low-income folks. Um, NC Child, which is a, a wonderful advocate for children on a host of issues out of Raleigh. We, we had a partnership group as well as UNC Charlotte, which was fantastic in some of the data analysis they did for us on where are there healthcare beneficiaries in our region. What we wanted to do with this site was to make it real, make that change that's happening to value-based care for Medicaid, something that impacts beneficiaries and providers, but also community-based organizations and nonprofits uh, that work with this population. And so it, this site ended up taking a little bit longer than, it looks like we just did it, but it really, there was a lot of design work that went into trying to make it as readable as possible. It's actually available in Spanish as well. Um, and what we wanted to do was to lay this out so that beneficiaries and what we consider conduit organizations, again, faith-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, other folks that are conduits to beneficiaries would understand what this change means for them. And so Rocky, if you just scroll down a little bit and I'll just sure. give you a, a flavoring of what's there. Um, we also updated it based upon COVID-19 and what that means for Medicaid beneficiaries and some of the changes that are gonna be in place because of that. And you'll see we have these different blocks. We're looking at Medicaid beneficiaries or if you're a safety net organization, if you're just a member of the community, uh, or if you're a provider, what does all this change mean for you? And we have a number of clickable links to go and find out additional information. But then we also dug a little bit deeper. So if you learn more about healthcare, you'll see that we created a little uh, ebook on some of the major changes that are impacting uh, Medicaid based upon COVID. We did a guidebook. We did a number of podcasts with experts that have worked on Medicaid transformation around the country. Um, a host of different resources that are there for people to, to understand what's getting ready to happen. And, and I can tell you one of the things that we learned in Mecklenburg County when this transformation was delayed as the state didn't pass a budget at the end of 2019, you know, we were getting ready to be in transformation starting in February of 2020. And when the budget didn't get passed, this, all of this work got put on hold. But what we learned before it got put on hold were a lot of things. First and most prominent for us, was that the beneficiaries in Mecklenburg County and in this first wave of transformation, we, there are about 115,000 residents, you know, more than one in five of us in Mecklenburg County uh, started to receive letters in the mail. And these were uh, long sort of packets of information. They're the kinds of things that go, I have a stack at home of the large, hard, dense material that I know I have to look at. Sometimes it's bills, sometimes it's stuff from the government that I'll eventually look at. Those came to Medicaid beneficiaries and what they told them was, you're getting ready to go into a whole new system and you're gonna have to pick between one of five different insurance companies to decide where you wanna get your care. And each of those five insurance companies in the Mecklenburg County area 
we're going to have a range of different things that they could provide. They're going to have different primary care docs that are signed up with them. They're going to have different specialty care docs that are signed up with them. They're going to offer uh, different incentives for you to join their program. Some of them will offer uh, some uh, educational discounts. Others would offer uh, phones for your family. Others would offer cab rides to job interviews. Some would offer out of school time programming, Y memberships, uh, uh, access to the Boys and Girls Club. They're all various different things. And what we were became concerned about is, as beneficiaries actually received the letter and were encouraged to start picking which, which of the five to go to before they, they pulled the plugs, they didn't pass the budget. Mm -hmm. Beneficiaries were completely confused over what to do. They did not understand where they needed to go for information. We knew that as up until it was early December, a week or so before the budget didn't pass and they, they halted on transformation, that only it was less than 10,000, probably closer to about 5,000 of the 115,000 people in Mecklenburg County had picked a plan. And what we were learning is that there were people that were receiving their primary care from one physician and they were maybe getting urological care or oncological care or another specialty from another doctor. And these docs were signing up with different um, health insurance companies. And so someone that was used to relying on that system of care was now gonna have to make a decision. Do I, is my primary care the most important to me and I'll develop a new relationship with an oncologist in that network? Or do I really love my oncologist? So I'm gonna go with that network and then have to get a new primary care person. We, just, we were discovering that the marketing materials and the outreach in the community wasn't as effective as we thought it needed to be. We knew that the state of North Carolina uh, has developed a, a raft of, of helpful online resources. But we know that at least in Mecklenburg County, uh, a lot of what the outreach consisted of was a, um, a, a flyer that was left at uh, local um, public health offices that was kind of a stack of these flyers that people would point to it and say, you can go pick that up and learn more information. Or you can read this really dense letter that you got in the mail that is really difficult even for someone that's um, used to working with health insurance companies to figure out what to do. We were very concerned that not enough people understood what was getting ready to happen. And, what, and that made us realize that if the beneficiaries weren't prepared for what was getting ready to happen, we had a hunch that the nonprofit agencies, folks beyond just health and wellness that are gonna be serving this population, they also weren't prepared what was getting ready to happen. So in many ways, at least for this project, there, it was actually a, maybe a blessing in disguise that there was a pause on rolling this out because mm -hmm. that has allowed us some time not only to fix this site and to try to get the most relevant, easy to understand information for people on what Medicaid transformation is, it's also allowed us to go back to the Kate B. Reynolds Found, uh, Charitable Trust and say, it's one thing to have a website with some interesting information and podcasts and things you can go to on your own to find the information, but how do you make that real for people that are in neighborhoods that are gonna be affected? How do you make it real for beneficiaries and their families that actually have to make this shift? How do you, how do you prepare neighborhood organizations where we know, and I give UNC Charlotte a tremendous amount of credit on their data analytics, the visuals and the things they provided us on where people are in Mecklenburg mm -hmm. County was extraordinary. But how do we help them get ready for the shift? How do we maximize the likelihood that they have a good experience through that shift? And so KB Reynolds is now funding a two-year project that we're leading with um, Greer Heights, uh, which is a community you know just south of town, There's about 3,000 folks, highly um, transient uh, uh, population, uh, large number of African Americans that are there, and also the U City Family Zone, which is an area that it borders UNC Charlotte, and it's much bigger, excuse me, than Greer Heights. We're talking 50,000 plus people. Uh, but there, that is an organization that has kind of organically risen over the last five to seven years, and they're addressing a variety of different issues all around those social determinants of health, around transportation and uh, access to care and access to food and affordable housing. And they have a infrastructure of decision-making that they've already created to start to look at these drivers of health. And we thought with KB Reynolds, that would be two great neighborhoods to test, to say, how can we help those two neighborhoods really get ready for this transformation? How can we prepare the housing groups and the, and the other access groups and the uh, the food insecurity group so that when we get into Medicaid transformation and when many of those groups can actually get paid 
for providing some of these services through relationships they're going to build with the insurance companies that are responsible for coordinating and then providing the care, we can have them really ready. And beneficiaries maybe can make the best choice about which of those five is really works best for who they are and how can those neighborhood organizations really lead on this effort so that they're seen as the expert and we we've provided the information and we want to go alongside them and equip them with as much knowledge as we as they need but ultimately at the end of the day it's those beneficiaries that are out in those neighborhoods that are going to be impacted and i would love it if this is going to happen again so open enrollment uh, is targeted to happen in the spring of 2021 and then the plan by the state is that we flip the switch in the summer of 2021 and we, we move in North Carolina, you know, one and a half million people into this entirely new system of care. Our hope is that because of this work and the things we're doing in those neighborhoods, that we will we'll have learned an awful lot about how best to get beneficiaries and communities, neighborhoods, community-based organizations ready for what this change means so that they can be prepared uh, to partner with insurance companies, to partner with us. In some cases, we may be providing care, but but to be not have this just wash ashore and then react to it a couple mm -hmm. years later, because it's definitely coming and there's an awful lot that we've learned from around the country and there's a lot of things that you can do right now to get ready for it. Yeah, no, it's going to be a, a shock to the system, you know, and I mean, it's, and it's a good thing, I think, it, you know, on balance, but almost kind of like when the Affordable Care Act came out, remember, and you know, you had to have, uh, you know, you had this marketplace and you had, you know, at least back when, it, you know, there was, you know, there was a lot of different things to choose from. And a lot of people had sort of the tyranny of choice, right? They, they sat there and they looked and was like, I don't know which one to pick. Because you were mentioned, um, I think you mentioned Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy. When I was at the law school, I had a couple of students who were part of the, the navigator program and they would devote their pro bono time to basically sitting with somebody to go through the marketplace and figure out which is the best plan. Um, and I don't know if that's something that, and I think this website and, and some of the work that you and the allies that you've, you've uh, caring has brought in the CCLA, NC Child, are, you know, is, is, is again, it's like from maybe sort of the consumer standpoint, you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, I was in a fee for service model. I used to just go here at my Medicaid card and, 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 and I got my medicine. And now um, I've got these people wanting to take me, uh, want to give me an Uber card or something like that. Yeah, you know, right. there's a, you know, I think there's a lot of education and I think you're right. I think that the fact that there was a little bit of a pause is actually not a bad thing in the sense that, um, because I think, I, you know, when, when people have traditionally, or at least, you know, historically gotten their health insurance or gotten their health care a certain way, and now all of a sudden, you know, the person that you're signed up to is now saying, uh, we want to send some contractors over to your house. It's like, what? Hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, right. uh, I, I, it, I'm sure it'll be a, a, a pleasant surprise, but it's a surprise nonetheless. And so I think that, um, and, and I think one of the reasons why we wanted to have this as a, as a topic is that, uh, is that the more that this is the, this is where it's going, you know, I think that while there is a hiccup, you know, obviously there's always politics, right? So, you know, obviously we've had a legislature that has not really been keen on expanding Medicaid, let alone transforming Medicaid, although they actually were okay with transforming. They just weren't okay with expanding. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think that for those of you in the audience who are either on boards of maybe some of the public charities or just, it, it, maybe your staff, maybe you're a director, um, you're, you're connected in the community. In whatever way you're connected in the community, understand that for uh, what was it, a million and a half low-income people in this, in this state alone, and maybe we expand it even more because we got an election coming up. And I know I'm not, we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of the election, but elections do have consequences. And if right. you certain shift a certain way, um, you know, there, there will be an expand. There's a, a, so that increases the class of people who are going to need to be educated about this, this transformation. Um, and um, they may need to rethink that 650, 650. Maybe may, may if we're going to expand that, maybe they need to ask for a little bit more to come down because we got a whole <laughs> new uh, uh, pot of people in, in the, in the mix here. But I do think that the more that um, a, that we educate ourselves, you know, as advocates, as, Part of the of the social sector so because when invariably you know those people you serve that you've been charged with serving come to you and they have that letter that don was talking about and i don't understand this then you can tell them this is what's going on but until we know what's going on, and i mean honestly it's it's been you know they moved the gulf coast so much with this thing that it's even hard for us 
who are, are trying to keep on top. And, and that's why it's a beautiful thing. Bookmark this, uh, this website, nchealth.org, for those of you particularly who are um, in the social sector, because this is going to be a great, I mean, this, is, this, this website is going to become even more relevant. So it's right now, it's, it's very cool to read, but it's going to be extremely useful and relevant. It's, it's going to be an evolving document, an evolving text that um, is going to serve as a resource for those in the social sector here in Charlotte. And I will also give Don a plug. Um, I think that I saw it here because I am a subscriber, is um, Seeking the Heart. It's a podcast that Don hosts. And um, I came across it. I think I even came across where I met you. I just sort of was like in the Charlotte area and I was searching around iTunes and found this and I listened to some of your stuff last fall. Um, and so definitely um, subscribe, give them five stars on, um, on iTunes. <laughs> and um, and that the, I, I told you, I'm going to plug you. I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug this website. I'm going to plug this podcast. You come on this show, you're going to get plugged. So those of I you who also, <laughs> you wanna, um, and um, I think I mentioned NC360. If you see right here, you go. So give you another reason to go ahead and bookmark this website. If you want to get your social service agency involved with NC360, you click that link, that'll take you right to um, that information that we were talking about. So if you want to get into the pipeline for even consideration for uh, social determinants of health funding for what you're doing, um, you got to get on the NC360. Um, so I have not seen anything pop up in the chat, but I think we're at a point now where we can definitely take some questions. So. I mean, either just just blurt it out because um, I don't see anything in the chat. So those of you who are are watching right now, um, this would be a great time to go ahead and you got you got the man right here, Don Jonas. So uh, you know, let him know. Let, go ahead and ask question. And I would also say, I, you know, I'd love if those of you, if this is maybe new to you, I genuinely would like feedback. Is it uh, was it missing information you thought would be there? Is it helpful? Is it not helpful? Are there some uh, different ways that we can share this more effectively with folks? I have uh, talked with the United Way, for example, about how we can get this kind of information out to the 90 plus nonprofits that are United Way agencies in the uh, greater Charlotte area. Uh, I've also talked with folks at Foundation for the Carolinas and elsewhere about how this can be something that's useful uh, for other nonprofits as they start to plan for the next couple of years and where this is going. I, because I do think the, the big shift, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm still working on how I can best share that with folks, is that this is coming at change in healthcare and in Medicaid. But I think the, the larger issue is that we're, we're fundamentally changing the way we're taking care of low-income folks. And we are thinking about, not just we, but the system is thinking about uh, those social drivers in ways that we really haven't ever tested or tried to do before. Uh, we're all starting to think about new partnerships with people that are far beyond healthcare uh, into education and housing and all the other things that we talked about. I, I don't think it would be unrealistic to think in five years or maybe in 10 years, there's a lot of consolidation in the nonprofit space because those places that can address the whole range of needs that people have are, it's going to be the most efficient way to get funding and get impact out to people in the community because I think the days of you and this is I'm speaking um, calling us out for that if, if, if caring is simply an access point for health care for low-income people the market has lots of different options for people like that but if you're a low-income person and you need your access to care it's highly likely you need access to lots of those other social drivers as well. And the, those organizations that can position themselves so they can provide that range of services for people, or at least can direct people to those range of services are the ones that are going to, in my opinion, I think be the most successful down the road. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I know that we, uh, it, it, it's another term, it has the term social in it, but I do think that in many respects, you know, one of the things I, that had hit Charlotte was that whole, um, that one study that said Charlotte was 50 out of 50 in, in social mobility. And I think that your health, you know, is a factor in your social mobility. I mean, it's um, no doubt. Of, of a number of factors. And I think that if we want to not be the, 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 the national, the, 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 the global city that's 50 out of 50 in social mobility, then, you know, adopting the social determinants of health, um, you know, supporting our, our public charities that are been doing God's work for, forever. But now, I mean, it's, uh, it, it will also, you know, really provide more sustainability for 
uh, nonprofits. Again, I mean, the one the only thing that, and I, that's why I said, like, when I said, you know, if we're going to expand Medicaid, let's, let's, let's get them to jack up the $650 uh, million dollars that they're going to provide everybody because um, it, it's, just, it's just the money. It'll run out, you know, because, it, but it'll work. I, I mean, the, I, if, hear me out here. This is the one thing I will say. It's going to work. I think you will see these outcomes because I think those of us in who have been in this, we see it. You just know it. You know that poverty is like one of those blights that if you can take the poverty aspect out, your health outcomes are just going to get better because when you have money, you just get healthier, right? It's a, and so I think that um, we're, where I think that I mean, in many ways, I feel like common sense is finally catching up with the medical community in some respects. Yeah. And, um, I, and I think this is a very, you know, it's an exciting time. But, you know, for those of us, and this is one reason we want to do this show is we got to educate about what in the world Medicaid transition can't just be the buzzword that you hear or you see in a mass uh, email or, or you go to a conference and you skip the, you skip the topic on that because you want to go to lunch with your friend, you know, about social determinants of health. Um, we've got to educate ourselves because we're going to ultimately, um, those of you who are in the, in, the, in the social sector, in those community groups, in those uh, head Start program, early early childhood education, or legal aid, or 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 just uh, social work. Even you know, um, you're going to have to explain Medicaid transformation. These folks uh, that are 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 being affected by it, um, mm -hmm. and and we've got to do our best to you know educate them as well because you know um, there are four or five different new providers depending on which region of the state you're in, and all of them are trying to sell. I mean, you know, like you said, some are offering free Uber drives and some are offering meal to, you know, it's, it's, um, but at the end of the day, you know, um, is that enough? And, and because now it, and so um, it is a lot to ask for, but I think that this website, um, what Caring is doing, um, what the, the CCLA and NC Child and UNC Charlotte, I mean, these are great organizations coming together because um, it, it's just, it's just, a, it's, uh, we're on the cusp of a very, I think a revolutionary period as far as how we look at how we fund healthcare in this country. I mean, obviously there's discussions about who pays for healthcare. That's a whole other story. Um, that's a different, uh, different policy discussion, but what we're paying for, and I think the move from fee for service to, um, to outcomes, I think will even, I think it will trickle up. I think that you will start to see it work at the, at the, at the at, with, with Medicaid that other, um, you know, Medicare, other things like that, they may very well start to, um, you know, embrace this notion of uh, social determinants of health and, and funding. So it, you know, it, it starts with the, it starts here at this level, but it may, you know, the sky's the limit, honestly, in, in, in many respects, because I, I just, I mean, I firmly believe, and I think a lot of us do that, this stuff just works. It, you're going to get results if you take care of those social determinants. Any questions? Wow, I mean, we've been the only ones talking. Please, ask, somebody, Shannon, even ask a question. Somebody. All right. <laughs> no, people have to go. I bet that's fine. I, this is awesome for me to have a chance to share this with you and and uh, the folks on the call. And I, I genuinely am open to any feedback and would love to share more. There's a whole host of materials. I've got you know almost I think 80 or 90 slides and a slide deck that are related to this that hopefully give a variety of different uh, perspectives and background on this issue. And I, I'm grateful for the time, uh, Rocky, to share a little bit more about this work with uh, Absolutely. So again, you, you, see the web, you see the website up here, nchealthguide.org. Um, you know, go ahead and plug it into your, uh, into your, I was about to say Netscape, and I'm going, God, it's old. That shows how old I am. Who uses that? Into your Chrome or your Firefox or your Edge and uh, go ahead and, and check out this website. And uh, again, Don, thank you. It's always a privilege and a pleasure to get to talk with you, particularly in this modicum. And on behalf of Holland Chandler, I just want to thank you for your time. I'd like on back, Holland Chandler, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your incredible busy day to listen to our, our leadership series. And uh, we'll let you know. Shannon is the uh, is the producer of this uh, this event, and she'll obviously be uh, recording everyone's emails here. Um, and we'll definitely follow up with you uh, more about our next uh, leadership series. But uh, on behalf of Holland Chandler, and, and thank you again, Don Jonas. Uh, you are free to leave the Zoom. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Bye bye. Appreciate it.